Were you there when they crucified our Lord? Yes, we we were were there. there. Were you there when they nailed him to a tree? Yes, we we were were there. there. Were you there when they laid him in a tomb? Yes, we We were were there. there. Were you there when they said, this Jesus must die? Yes, we we were there. At times it causes us to tremble when we consider the sorrow, pain, and suffering you so freely took upon yourself for us. As we follow you to the cross, we can't help but ask why this horrible thing must happen. How is it that the shouts of Hosanna have so quickly turned to shouts of crucify him? But deep down we know, deep down we know whose sin causes your death. It is our sin, our rejection, our treason that brought you to Calvary. Yes, we were truly there. We humbly pray that your love, forgiveness, and mercy that so greatly offended us may now be extended to us. Grant that we may die to our sin and so be raised to new life with you. We ask all this and everything else in the words you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was so short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham, for the For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. I'll never forgive Jesus for that. Of all the people he could have stayed with, why Zacchaeus? Of all the inhabitants of Jericho, Zacchaeus was the worst possible choice. Zacchaeus was a traitor, a turncoat. He had sold out to the enemy. And to top it all off, he was getting rich in the process. You've got to hand it to the Romans. They're as smart as they are cruel. They know how much we Israelites hated paying their stinking taxes. No one likes taxes. But it's twice as bad when the money goes to the empire that has conquered your country and not occupies it. And so who do the Romans get to collect their taxes? Do they send Roman tax collectors? No. They hire our people to do their dirty work for them. And how do they pay these dirty traitors? Tax collectors can charge whatever they can get away with. And after they send in what Rome expects, they get to keep whatever's left. No questions asked. What sort of people would help the enemy to steal from their own people at the same time? I'll tell you what kind. Greedy pigs. Pigs who are out to make an easy buck. Even if it means working for the Romans and stealing from your own people. And that's exactly the kind of person Zacchaeus is. Someone who betrayed his own people. Happily got rich off their toil and labor and through it all helped keep the Romans in power. And oh, how rich he became in the process. He admits it himself. His, he promises to give half his possessions to the poor and repay all those he's defrauded four times as much. Where do you think he got all that money in the first place? He got it from us. He's cheated us and robbed us for years. Well, all the time, he's lived high and mighty. And now he thinks he can make it all better by giving back part of what he's stolen. Makes me sick. Makes me sick even to think about it. And now how does he get repaid for all this evil? What's his punishment for selling out his people? 
Jesus declares him saved. Of all people, Jesus says salvation has come to Zacchaeus. It isn't right. It isn't fair. Jesus has no right to say Zacchaeus will be saved. Zacchaeus is the worst kind of sinner. Jesus is way out of line. He's really, he's really kind of dangerous. Something should be done about him. We can't stand for this. Jesus must die. Today's reading is Luke 13, verse 10 through 17. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water. Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for eighteen long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. And so ends the scripture. I resent being called a hypocrite. I was just doing my job. I was the leader of the synagogue. I had to say something. I wasn't the one in the wrong. Jesus was the one making trouble. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking all Jesus did was heal this poor woman. How could that be wrong? It's not that Jesus healed her. It's when he healed her. He healed her on the Sabbath. Healing is considered work. And work is plainly forbidden on the Sabbath. Now, that's not my idea. I didn't come up with that rule. God did. It's the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath. To the Lord your God, you shall not do any work. This Jesus has no right to go around breaking God's commandments whenever he feels like it. This may sound harsh, but it really isn't. Following God's commandments gives order and structure to our lives. What would happen if people just decided to stop following the fifth commandment, you shall not kill? Society would fall into chaos. And that's why something as simple as healing on the Sabbath must be stopped. If that kind of thinking spreads, it could lead to all kinds of trouble. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not upset that Jesus healed with this poor woman. It was a great act of kindness and an impressive demonstration of God's healing power. But not on the Sabbath. We couldn't have, why couldn't he have just waited a few hours to heal her? Soon the Sabbath would have ended and then everything would have been fine. 
she'd been this way for 18 years. Would a few more hours really make any difference? If he had just waited, we could have avoided all this trouble. But for whatever reason, Jesus didn't wait. He just forged ahead, breaking God's law, ignoring our tradition, making a mockery of our way of life. And not only that, he drove a wedge between those of us in authority and the common people. Those of us with positions of leadership had no choice but to question his acts. It is our job to defend the tradition. But the common people are so swept up in Jesus' teachings and healings, they can't see the larger picture. They don't see how dangerous this Jesus is. We must put a stop to him. Jesus can't be allowed to continue to cause trouble. He's dangerous. This Jesus must die. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 31. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I can't believe this is happening. My teenage son has just come home sprouting some new philosophy that's bound to get him into trouble. Those of you who are parents of teenagers will know what I'm talking about. You know how impressionable teenagers are. They're always excited about whatever is the newest craze, no matter how crazy it is. One of the toughest jobs in the world has got to be raising kids and keeping them on the right track. The last thing we need it is some crazy preacher filling our kids' heads with new and revolutionary ideas, especially dangerous ideas. What kind of dangerous ideas, you ask? How about this one for starters? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who abuse you. Can you believe it? It's the kind of ideas my kids are coming home with. And if that's not bad enough, this crazy preacher is telling my kids that if someone hits them, they should just stand there and get hit a second time. He says if a thief steals your coat, take off your shirt and give them to that as well. And, and then my favorite, give to everyone who begs. Can you believe it? He tells them to give to beggars. There's nothing worse than walking down a big city street and seeing all those beggars. You know that whatever you give them, they won't make a bit of difference. It's just like throwing your hard-earned money away. If I told my children once, I told them a thousand times, give beggars sympathy, not money. But what do they, do they listen to what we teach them? No. They'd rather listen to some preacher who doesn't have anything to give away. They'd rather listen to someone who sums up his philosophy like this, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Can you believe that? This guy's got it all backwards. It's supposed to be do unto others what they do to you. I have no trouble being good to those who are good to me, and, and that's what I've taught my children. 
But this idea of loving your enemies and giving without getting back, it's crazy. I don't want my children throwing away their lives. I want my children to be happy and successful. And like it or not, that means you're going to be tough. And you've got to watch out for yourself, take what's yours, and fight for your rights. You know, this really ticks me off. I try to raise my kids to be responsible, successful people, and then this Jesus comes along and fills their heads with all sorts of mush. This Jesus is dangerous. Someone should do something about him. We can't just sit around and let him teach our children this kind of stuff. This Jesus must be silenced. This Jesus must die. John 8, 2-11 At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. In the, in the law, Moses commanded us to, so, to stone such woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this those who heard began to go away, one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing. Jesus sprang up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Have no one com condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. A gross miscarriage of justice took place that day. I was among the Pharisees who brought that shameful woman to Jesus. We knew it was his custom to go and teach at the temple, and we were sure we would find him there. And now we finally had a perfect opportunity to clear up all this confusion. It's one thing to talk about forgiving sinners. It's another to deal with a sinner who was caught in the act. We were sure Jesus couldn't weasel his way out of this one. Once and for all, we would make him acknowledge that sinners must pay. Everything was going perfectly at first. The adulterous woman never once denied her guilt, never once even begged for mercy. Like the rest of us, she knew she was wrong. She knew she deserved punishment. God's law must be upheld. Everything was going perfectly. Even Jesus made no reply at first. He just bent over and started drawing on the ground. At last, the great teacher had nothing to say. There was no way to get out of this one. The woman deserved death, period. When Jesus finally did speak, I thought we had won for sure. He said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He admitted she deserved death. We had won. Jesus couldn't deny the law this time. I started looking around for a stone to carry out the judgment. It was then that I realized something was wrong. The rest of the scribes and Pharisees looked uncomfortable. I couldn't believe my eyes. They were going to let the, this stop them, were they? We are righteous people. We follow the law. We make the proper sacrifices. We do what God expects of us. 
We had every right to judge this woman and then carry out the judgment. We were not caught sinning, she was. Then things went from bad to worse. Everyone started walking away. These people who had done everything in their power to follow God's law had been chased off by Jesus' trickery. Maybe none of us was completely without sin. Nobody's perfect. But we were surely better than this evil woman before us. It was all I could do to keep from shouting at my colleagues to stop. What's the matter with all of you, I wanted to say. This woman deserves death. Don't let a little case of conscience cloud your judgment. Compared to her, we are without sin, but I said nothing. I just stood there as they walked away. I finally left too. I couldn't believe this Jesus won again. Now more than ever, I know how much he must be stopped. He can't go on making a mockery of our law and accusing good people of being sinners. He's dangerous. This Jesus must die. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So. He went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pot that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hive hands have bread enough and to, and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This parable ruined my life. I'm not kidding. It ruined my life. Let me tell you about it. My father and I were there when Jesus was teaching this parable that you call the prodigal son. And it was almost as if he were talking about our family. My father has two sons, myself and a younger brother. And the similarities, unfortunately, don't end there. My younger brother is spoiled, undisciplined, wasteful, and a good-for-nothing. Of course, it took my father years to realize this, Dad was always making an excuse for his little baby boy. And soon my brother didn't even have to need to make his own excuses. Dad would make them for him. And of course, I played my part in our little family drama. I was the responsible one. I did my share of the work and my brother's. Dad finally came to his senses. Somehow, my father found the courage to admit to himself that this couldn't continue. He knew it wasn't right, and so Dad kicked my brother out. Those were the good days. We hired someone to take his place, and for the first time, the work started getting done. Schedules were met, productivity rose, profits were made. And after time, even my father seemed to accept that the loss of his son in exchange for productivity and efficiency was a good thing. But then it happened. Jesus came along. My father and I just happened to be where Jesus was teaching. He was teaching the parables. He taught one about a lost sheep, one about a lost coin. And then there was a man who had two sons. That was the beginning of the end. 
When the parable was over, my father was in tears and went out to find his baby boy. My father came home late that night. He, he was half carrying my brother, who was too drunk to walk. Before I could say anything, Dad said that my brother was here to stay. That was two years ago. We went bankrupt a few months after my brother came home. My father fell sick, and we couldn't afford a doctor, and he died. My brother disappeared soon after that and hasn't been seen since. And me? I now work for minimum wage on someone else's farm. And all because of Jesus and his parables. You know, I don't know if my father really even understood what Jesus was getting at in that parable. Jesus was talking about how God treats sinners, not how fathers treat their sons. I get angry every time I think about it. Just look what that kind of thinking did to me. Can you imagine what would happen if God really forgave sinners like that? What was Jesus thinking? How could he say such things? Someone should stop him. He's dangerous. Jesus must die. They took Jesus to the high priests, and all the chief priests, elders and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself by the fire, at the fire. The chief priests in the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave his false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple, and then three days will build another, not made by man. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck them with their fists, and said, Prophecy! And the guards took him and beat him. For a moment there, I thought our case against this Jesus might not hold up. We had lined up so many witnesses to testify against him that surely two of them would agree on some horrible thing he said or done. But we were having no such luck. None of their testimony was the same. I was afraid we were going to have to let him go. I knew Pilate would not have him executed if he couldn't pin something solid on him and back it up with at least two witnesses. And if ever anyone needed to be killed... It was Jesus.
I had been hearing for months about all the trouble he was causing, stirring up the crowds, arguing with the religious authorities, even claiming to be the Messiah. That's exactly what I needed. Some would-be Messiah to stir up the masses and start an armed rebellion against Rome. Could you imagine the bloodshed and the destruction, not to mention the religious and political consequences? The last thing I needed was some blaspheming rabble rather to mess everything up I had worked for. But now, we had finally brought him to trial and everything just seemed to be slipping away. We were out of witnesses. We proved nothing. We would have to let him go. I knew I only had one more chance and I knew it was a long shot. But what other choice did I have? I asked him straight out. Are you the Messiah? The son of the blessed one? I expected him not to answer. I assumed he would just remain silent. But I couldn't believe my ears when he answered, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. It was more than I could have hoped for in my wildest dreams. Right there in front of everyone, he openly admitted to being both Messiah and God's Son. We needed no more evidence. We needed no more witnesses. Pilate would have to do something now. Pilate, Pilate would have to kill anyone who claimed to be king or God, and this Jesus just claimed to be both. <laughs> Pilate would never know what a favor he was doing me when he sentenced this Jesus to death. Finally, all my troubles would be over. Jesus' reputation as a teacher, a healer, a miracle worker, whatever, would slowly fade away. His ragtag followers would disband, and all this nonsense would come to an end. Order would be restored. Jesus has caused enough trouble. Someone has to do something about it. He's dangerous. He has to be stopped. He has to be silenced. There's no doubt about it. This Jesus must die. The scripture is from Luke 23, 23 to 49. But with loud shouts, they instantly determined that he had to be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As the soldiers led him away, they see Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wounds that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. 
or if the people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, who were led out with him to be crucified, when they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and, and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our, de our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you are in your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I say to you, today you will see me in paradise. It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtains of the temple were torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God, saying, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered in to witness the sight saw what had taken place, they beat their breast and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance and watched these things. Here in the lesson. Leave this guy. Even as he hangs on the cross dying, he extends God's grace and mercy to those who don't deserve it. Who is he to say, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise? Doesn't he get it? Doesn't he realize that's exactly the kind of talk that got him crucified? We've had enough of his offering God's grace and mercy to the undeserving. He can't be allowed to continue forgiving sinners like that. What about us? What about us good religious people? What about those of us who try as hard as we can to do what God expects of us? We might not be perfect, but at least we try. Don't we deserve something for at least trying? I hate to admit it, but I resent the fact that Jesus freely offers sinners what I have worked so hard to earn. Now I understand why so many people thought Jesus must die. His notion of God's forgiveness really is offensive to those of us who try our best to earn God's salvation. And I always assumed bad people thought Jesus must die. All of a sudden, that other thing Jesus said from the cross makes sense. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. I never thought that they included me. It makes you wonder if we're as good as we think we are. We obviously need as much forgiveness as anyone else Jesus forgave. But it's too late now. Jesus is crucified. He's dead and buried. Without knowing it, we put to death the one God sent to save us. But we can't undo what we've done. It's out of our hands. I guess it's all up to God now. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I loved that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain.
stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. Something